I want to get to this um, super important uh, theorem that I sort of um, teased at the end of the last video um, regarding symmetric matrices and their eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, um, just to give you a very quick recap of what we've talked about, uh, we're talking about real symmetric matrices, so A transpose is equal to A. And um, remember this really big uh, result we had from the last uh, last video, which is this right here. I think this was called lemma 2 in the last video. And this says that if uh, V sub lambda is an eigenvector for A with eigenvalue lambda, and if V sub mu is another eigenvector for A with a different, a distinct eigenvalue mu, then it turns out that V mu and V lambda are orthogonal. All right, and we, uh, we went through the proof of that in the last video, and uh, I sort of mentioned this more general fact, which is that these so-called eigenspaces for lambda and mu are going to be orthogonal. All right, so these are entire vector uh, subspaces, these uh, eigenspaces. So you've got entire um, vector subspaces that are orthogonal to each other. All right, and you can um, imagine this. We saw an example last time um, where one of these eigenspaces was a plane. It was two-dimensional, and the other eigenspace was one-dimensional. And so visually speaking, uh, you would have something like this, right? You'd have uh, one eigenspace being this purple line I just drew, and the other eigenspace being this red plane, and they are orthogonal to one another. Right? In other words, that purple line is normal. It's the normal line to the red plane. Right? Um, each eigenspace has an orthogonal basis, which we saw uh, is possible because we know Gram-Schmidt, right? So we did that last time. And the question that I left off with last time, which I sort of um, tried to draw an analogy back to, like, the Frenet frame, the Frenet uh, uh, frame vectors for uh, a given space curve, which are the uh, unit tangent, unit normal, and unit binormal, N, T, and B, that I drew last time. Uh, so what happens if we put all these uh, different orthogonal bases of all of these eigenspaces together into one large collection of vectors. What happens then? So we have this theorem, which I hinted at last time. If A is an n by n symmetric matrix, uh, then Rn has an orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors for A. All right, so uh, all of these eigenvectors um, can be thrown together into a big collection of vectors, and that collection of vectors turns out to always be a basis for Rn. The orthogonal part, right, so I, I claim it's orthonormal here. Uh, the orthogonal part is really the hard part, of course. Uh, the orthogonal part comes from the fact that if you have distinct eigenspaces, so you've got distinct eigenvalues, well, then you get orthogonality for free. That's what this lemma told us. And if you happen to have an eigenspace that looks, you know, the analogy being this red plane here, um, so you have a, a higher dimensional eigenspace, uh, higher than dimension one, well, then you just use Gram-Schmidt to orthogonalize uh, any basis for that eigenspace, and all of a sudden, you now have an orthogonal basis for that eigenspace, which will then be orthogonal by this fact up here, will be orthogonal to everything else in all the other eigenspaces. Hence, you know, sort of uh, throwing that all together, logically speaking, you are uh, forming a giant orthogonal, mutually orthogonal set of vectors. And then once you have the orthogonal set of vectors, the normal part is easy. Just unitize every vector in your giant collection. All right, so um, the proof of this, uh, a lot of the elements we've already discussed, um, we've sort of handled... Um, Two of the big points, which is what happens with distinct eigenvalues, well, that gives you, dis uh, that gives you orthogonal eigenspaces. And um, the second part would be uh, what happens if you have a multidimensional eigenspace. How do you guarantee an orthogonal basis for that? And that's the Gram-Schmidt algorithm. All right, so then um, there are some uh, very important details that I am omitting from this. 
for instance, how do you always know that you will get n of these vectors? Right, because it's supposed to be a basis for our n, so there should be n of them. How do you know you'll always get n of them? Um, that is a non-trivial thing. Um, I'm not going to address it here. Uh, it's a little more linear algebra um, than I really want to get into. Uh, a little more hard linear algebra than I really want to get into now. So, right, so what? What's what's the point of this theorem, right? Why, why should we care? Um, so let's try to write it out, right? Let's, let's write out exactly what this is saying. Suppose that lambda 1 through lambda n are the eigenvalues for a. And here, a is n by n, so I'm making an, a, a list of n eigenvalues. And remember, in the example we did last time, we uh, were looking at a 3 by 3 matrix, and the eigenvalues were, uh, I think, something like negative 1, lambda 2 was 2 or 3, I can't remember what it was, um, but we had something like this, and lambda 2 was actually repeated, right? It, it occurred twice in the, um, the algebra we did. We got two roots of, uh, of lambda 2, corresponding to lambda 2. So uh, in this list being n numbers long, what we're saying, and I, I just want to make sure we're all clear about this, what we're saying is that we would actually throw on a lambda 3, because our matrix in the last example was 3 by 3, we would have to throw on a lambda 3 to make this list complete the way I've written it, and it would just be the same number again, because it was repeated. All right, so if you were trying to make this list the way I'm writing it in the last video, you would actually just go ahead and call a third eigenvalue just the repeated eigenvalue of 2, okay? So that's what, uh, the one very small point that I wanted to make here was that uh, in order to write out this list having n eigenvalues in it, it means that repeats are possible. All right, so uh, there could be repeats. Um, to give you an extreme example, uh, if you had, say, the zero matrix, right, so the matrix that's just all zeros everywhere, um, every single uh, lambda would be zero, and we would still write it out, you know, n times. Whoops. All right, so lambda n. Lambda 1 through lambda n would all be zeros for that example. All right, that's an extreme example. Uh, so even if it's repeated, you just go ahead and repeat it. You don't try to save space or anything like that. You just go ahead and repeat. All right, so this list could be a, a very redundant list, but that's okay for right now. All right, so we're going to take all these eigenvalues, and we know based on everything we just said, in particular from that theorem that, uh, that I just mentioned, that we can then take an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Um, so each one of these u's, uh, I'm calling them u's instead of v's here, because I really just wanted to um, remind you guys that these are unit length, hence u. Right, so the length of ui is 1 for all i. And u lambda i is orthogonal to u lambda j. Um, for all i not equal to j. Alright, so we have this beautiful orthonormal uh, basis of eigenvectors for our matrix. And by the theorem, this is an orthonormal basis for Rn. Right, there are n of them. We're in Rn. They're orthogonal. You know, they're orthonormal, of course, but uh, at a bare minimum, they're orthogonal, which means they're linearly independent. So this thing has to be a basis, right? Now, let's dive back into um, all those videos we did uh, over the last couple weeks, or few weeks, I should say, uh, relating to basis theory. Let's go ahead and rehash some of that right now. All right, so if V is any vector in Rn, we know from the, the videos we did before that V can be written in this way, right? You can decompose V uh, in terms of these basis vectors with very, very specific coefficients. The coefficients Ci 
are given by just the dot product of v dot u sub lambda i. And again, remember, this is because uh, the um, uh, u lambda i's are an orthonormal basis. Right, that's why it turns out to just be a dot product. That's why we're not dividing by u lambda i dot u lambda i, at least not explicitly, um, because that dot product is just the norm squared of u lambda i, which is 1. Right, so um, we're just using the orthonormal um, basis properties here from the basis videos we did before, the basis theory videos. Okay, so here's really the... Uh, the key thing that I want to remind you of, and that is this awesome fact right here, that really all we're doing in finding this um, basis representation in terms of this ortho orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, well, it's forget the eigenvector part just for a second. It's still just an orthonormal basis of vectors. And this means that uh, this V can be written uh, as a sum of projections onto these orthonormal basis vectors. All right, so this was like, um, I think it was probably the biggest thing that, uh, that we led up to with all those basis theory videos was leading up to the fact that orthogonal bases, and in particular orthonormal bases, uh, always have this projection property. Right, this, uh, this fact here about projections, this is not um, because it's orthonormal. This is because it's orthogonal. Uh, the orthonormal part just makes it so that um, this green box is is true, right? It's a very easy, very straightforward um, coefficients to calculate uh, when you're looking at the basis expansion. You're just looking at the dot product instead of um, a more complicated scalar projection. Anyway, uh, the most important part is uh, is that it's a sum of projections onto these individual eigenvectors. So, what happens? when we apply a to this vector v, right? What does this look like? Well, we know that uh, v can be represented in this basis of eigenvectors like this. And we know that a is, uh, a acts linearly, right? It's uh, matrix multiplication, so um, we just distribute this thing into everything. And that turns it into uh, this line at the bottom of the screen here, All right? So we pull the C's out, and we just have A times um, U lambda 1 through U lambda N. And A times U lambda I for any I, well, we know exactly what this is because the U sub lambda I's are eigenvectors, right? So this is going to be lambda I, U lambda I. Right? A is just going to be replaced by uh, scalar multiplication by the eigenvalue that's appropriate. All right, so that's what we end up with down here. Right? We're using this fact uh, n times down here. And what can be said about this? Well, let's take these lambdas, and let's just move them slightly. All right, so we're really just rewriting this, um, this line here slightly. Uh, sorry, that's lambda 1, plus up through lambda n, cn, u lambda n. All right, and now... Remember what these things were. Right? These things, tracking back up here, well, these things were just the projections onto these individual subspaces, right? Onto these individual vectors. So, what we can say here, uh, let me go there, what we can say is that this is really lambda 1, projection onto u lambda 1 of v, plus all the way up through lambda n, projection onto u lambda n of v. 
Okay, so uh, let me summarize that just in, in one line. Um, that might be a little bit cleaner. So what we're saying here is that for any V, okay, no matter what V is, AV can be written as lambda 1 projection onto the first eigenvector of V plus lambda n projection onto the nth uh, eigenvector of V. And these are just the standard orthogonal projections that we've been dealing with all semester. And if you look at what this is really saying, well, what happens if I take these V's that are he all here, and I sort of factor them out to the end, right? This is still linear algebra at the end of the day, so this is all just matrix multiplication in a sense. Um, here I've, of course, written it as uh, more like an operator uh, kind of thing, like the orthogonal projections are operators as far as we've defined them. Um, but the same sort of principle applies. So uh, if I write it this way, But I factor the v's all the way out to the end. Then hopefully what you see here is something pretty cool, right? What you see here is that, well, I've got a being applied to v, and I've got this thing being applied to v on the other side of the equal sign. And this is true for every single V in Rn. So, what we're saying here is that A really is just a sum of projections. Onto every one of the individual eigenvectors. And notice we didn't really need an orthonormal set of eigenvectors for this. Orthogonal would have done just fine. Um, orthonormal is really just nice for practicality of calculating these coefficients in green here. Um, it's, it's more straightforward to calculate those. All right, but just for this purpose, all we needed was orthogonality. We did not need orthonormality. Uh, and so what we find is that uh, this really quite remarkable fact. A is just a sum of eigenvalues times projections onto eigenvectors. So the biggest consequence of this is something that requires a lot more linear uh, algebra than we're able to really cover in this amount of time, since this wasn't a course entirely devoted to this. Uh, but the biggest consequence of this I mean, this is already large, right? This is a very important consequence. But uh, the biggest consequence of this is um, what happens if you look in terms of this um, basis of eigenvectors. Um, so this is kind of hard to explain if you ha haven't had three months of, uh, of linear leading up to this. Um, but the idea is that... Uh, Linear operators can have matrix representations relative to different bases. Okay, so this is um, this is one of the more important parts of uh, linear algebra if you're taking a like linear operator viewpoint on it. So, for instance, if you had taken my linear algebra course, you would know what all of this means. Um, so, uh, linear operators have uh, Different are represented by uh, different matrices depending on the basis that you are choosing. Okay, so uh, here is the big idea for why this sum of projections idea matters as far as a matrix is concerned. Um, 
if you were to look uh, relative to the basis consisting of the eigenvectors themselves. All right, then uh, the idea here would be that the projection onto just the first uh, the first eigen vector, right? So u lambda one. All right, so this. Oh, I'm sorry, not lambda. If I were to write this as a matrix, this would look like. Right, just the project projection onto the first thing in the basis, well, this would look like a 1 in the top left corner and zeros everywhere else. Right, so just to verify this to yourself, uh, if you were to um, apply this to a vector, apply this to... the vector c1 through cn and you know you're gonna go row by column that's gonna give you a c1 up there then you're gonna go row by column that's gonna give you a zero because that's that all the other rows are entirely zeros and so you just get zeros left whoops Didn't do that in green all right um, so if you uh, think about what this is saying, um, this vector uh, that is our output here, C1 and then all zeros, this is exactly um, the projection onto the first coordinate of, uh, of this vector in this basis expansion that is the basis of eigenvectors, right? So this is um, this is a bit uh, confusing, um, or can be a bit confusing if you are not familiar in talking, uh, if you're not if you're not comfortable talking in these terms. Um, but remember that we did. Uh, I had you guys do an example uh, as one of the exercises where you found the coordinates of a vector relative to a, a basis, a different basis than you were used to, and this is what we're talking about, right? So the C1 through Cn's would be the coordinates of this vector relative to the basis u lambda 1 through u lambda n. And the projection onto this, um, onto this basis would be, I'm sorry, onto the, the first vector in that basis. That should just give you the first coordinate in that expansion, right? It should just give you uh, C1 and then all zeros, right? So it should zero out everything but the first, um, the first coordinate. And the claim here is that this matrix does exactly that, right? So this is the idea. Um, now, if you put all this together, right? So A is really uh, eigenvalue time projection, times projection onto eigenvectors. Then what this is saying is that In the basis of eigenvectors, um, the projections look like matrices that are just a single one and then all zeros elsewhere. And right, this would be the first one. The second one would, I'm not going to write out more than just these two. I just want to, you know, um, hopefully make it a little bit clearer if, if this is confusing. Uh, this would be zeros everywhere. And then it would be a one right there on the diagonal. And then zeros elsewhere, right? Zeros everywhere except that, that one spot. Um, and so all the, the projection... Um, matrices relative to this basis of eigenvectors 
they would all look like uh, a matrix that is n by n, but is zero everywhere except for precisely one spot. And it's going to be uh, a spot on the diagonal. All right, so um, all these projection uh, matrix representations are just going to look like a one at various points on the diagonal. All right, and uh, all the other entries except for that one single one will be zeros. Okay, so in this basis, uh, these projection operators look like these matrices, can be represented by these matrices, I should say. And thus, what this is saying is that in the basis consisting of these eigenvectors, uh, A, we already know, looks like lambda 1 projection onto u lambda 1 plus all the way up through lambda lambda n projection onto u lambda n right we already know that and now relative to this basis each one of these projections looks a very specific way in terms of the matrix representation so this is going to be lambda 1 times the matrix that's only a 1 in the top left corner and zeros everywhere else And we're going to add that up right all the way through to the last one, which is lambda n, which is zeros everywhere except for the bottom left corner, right? That's the last place that's going to have a 1 in that last projection matrix. Right? In other words, if you throw all this together, you're going to get a lambda 1 in the top left corner. You'll get a lambda 2, the next thing on the diagonal, and then a lambda n down in the bottom right-hand corner. In other words, relative to, uh, to this matrix, I'm sorry, relative to the basis consisting of the eigenvectors for A, which have to be orthogonal um, for this to work, relative to this orthogonal basis of eigenvectors, uh, a can be made to look like a diagonal matrix. This is really the crucial thing, and the really important part is that this is this is the matrix representation of A relative to the basis U lambda 1 through U lambda n. All right, so at the end of the last video, I was talking about what things look like uh, you know, I, I think I sort of mentioned it as like um, seeing how the space looks uh, from the perspective of A, um, right? That sort of weird, uh, nonsensical statement I made. Uh, this is what I meant. Relative to the basis uh, consisting of eigenvectors, what does A look like? Okay, and uh, the idea here, there's a very specific way of, uh, of manipulating matrices to turn one basis representation into another. This is the idea of similar matrices, which you should have seen in, uh, in linear algebra. And so the idea here is that um, we can uh, make explicit this relationship between the, this diagonal matrix, which I'll call D, and the original matrix A uh, in terms of only matrix multiplication, right? None of this basis relative to other things, matrix representation relative to whatever basis and uh, all that um, language that I talked about before. So what we can do is say that, and this is where the linear algebra piece uh, becomes crucial, but we're not going to get into it. Uh, what we can do is say this, uh, that if we uh, multiply on the left and the right, multiply A on the left and the right by some specific matrices, then we can turn it into a diagonal matrix. And here, this matrix U consists of these eigenvectors that we found. These are column vectors in the matrix, right? So those things are columns. And what's really great is that uh, in choosing these um, eigenvectors to be an orthonormal basis, it actually enables us to not take the inverse of U, uh, at least it makes it easier to take the inverse of U because we only need to take the transpose. Um, this is why having an orthonormal set of eigenvectors is uh, awesome. Uh, it makes this matrix uh, algebra stuff a lot more straightforward.
And all of these things are wrapped up in what is generally called the spectral theorem for symmetric matrices.